Hello and good evening. My name is Lorna Virgili and I would like to welcome you to this virtual community briefing hosted by Montgomery County Executive Mark Elridge. The purpose of tonight's event is for you to hear directly from our county executive and others as they answer questions that we have received from you, our county residents, parents, businesses, and community groups. The questions we are answering tonight have come from people like you who have reached out to us through social media, NC311, as well as emails and telephone calls. Of course, there is no way we can answer all of the questions in 90 minutes, but the idea is for us to address the most frequently asked questions that we have received as of today. After today's program, we will post the questions and the answers on our website for your reference. We also want to remind viewers that this discussion is being broadcast live on Facebook, YouTube, and on county channels, County Cable Montgomery. Immediately following the live broadcast, you can view the recording on Facebook and YouTube as well. We also want you to know that this is not your only opportunity to get information. Over the next few weeks, we'll be hosting additional conversations like this one. Y para aquellos residentes del condado de Montgomery de habla hispanoparlante, sepan que esta transmisión tiene traducción simultánea por el canal Condado TV, eh, también por Comcast y en nuestra página de Facebook. With that being said and done, let's get started with County Executive Mark Elrich for some opening remarks. County Executive. So, so first of all, I want to uh, thank all of you for being here and also thank anybody who's either tuned in now or is going to be um, listening later on. Uh, this is our second community briefing. We think it's important to try to give folks in the community as much information as we possibly can. And as, as Lorna said, we'll be doing more in the future. Uh, I want to start by saying that uh, today or um, late yesterday, Montgomery County lost its first employee, Michael Miller, who worked at the Ride On um, Bus Depot in uh, Silver Spring, was 60 years old. He leaves a wife and two adult kids behind. And we just want to express our condolences to the family. And this is a loss for everybody. And it's it's not unexpected that this happens in Montgomery County. It's, it's happening everywhere, but it's tragic every time it happens. And I just want to convey that, you know, we all share in this sense of loss for not just Michael, but for everybody else that uh, is undergoing this. Uh, we have been working diligently to manage this crisis. And uh, I would say that I, th I think that uh, because we did sheltering in, space, in place because we took steps like masks and things. I said, those are the things that we knew were necessary to turn the curve on the virus and minimize its spread. And I think the actions that were taken in the state of Maryland have probably helped minimize the spread in the state of Maryland. And I've um, been grateful to the governor for his cooperation and for the fact that he's actually been willing to lead and that uh, the basis of his decisions are being made on science. And I was on a conference call with him today, and when he was asked the question about when he was going to open up, he was very clear that we would not be opening up in a way that wasn't safe for the residents of the state of Maryland. And it's good to hear that <laughs> from a political leader. I wish all political leaders uh, took that approach. But I was, you know, Glad that we're doing that. We're able to, we've been able to work with them. We're trying to coordinate on supplies. I think everybody knows that supplies have been in short supplies, particularly personal protective equipment. And uh, I have to thank the procurement staff because I can't even imagine how many rabbit holes people have gone down when people have offered us stuff <laughs> at, at either amazingly good prices or astoundingly horrible prices. And and then you come to find out that it's either not available, not available, then you want it or not the thing that you thought it was. Mm -hmm. And trying to sort out through all that to find what we need has been a challenge, but we're getting there. We know the state has more equipment coming in. 
we're going to continue to supply. I've told our procurement people that uh, you're to continue to buy as if another crisis was coming. So that when in the likelihood that there's a rebound from this, the second step, we are not going to be in the situation that everybody in the country found itself in, which is trying to find supplies on the fly while the virus, um, the extent of the infections were growing. So we're going to make sure we have the things in place and it'll be better to be safe. And sorry, I'd rather have too many gloves, too many masks, and too many other pieces of protective equipment than too few. And so I want to assure people that we're going to continue by until we get to the point that we, that we feel safe. Um, we will make our own decision about opening based on what the governor does, so we will not be acting um, independent. I think it was okay for us to get out front on taking some of the protective measures, but I am not going to get out front on, on um, relaxing protective measures. I think we need to let the scientists and the doctors make those kind of decisions. I'm well aware that the economy is suffering. Um, our program went live, uh, financial help for the small businesses went live yesterday and we had, I've heard a number as high as over 3,500 applications. Uh, we, I don't want to get anybody's expectations up, $20 million with a maximum of $75,000 is not going to cover all those applications, but we're going to cover as many we, as we can, give as much aid as we can, um, look at the possibility of doing a second tranche of assistance. Not only for that, but also for the money we've said we were going to put out to individuals in the community. And uh, my last plea from this is uh, if, if you normally do charitable giving in Montgomery County, or even if you don't, look at the organizations, go to our web page, um, go to the COVID page, and there's a place about community organizations which, where you can donate and volunteer. Find somebody you can either give time or money to. Um, I know in the world of um, charitable organizations, this was a big fundraising season for them. They're not raising any funds. And a lot of them depend on these events in the spring to fund their operations or fund significant parts of their operations. They're not going to be having those events. And so what I've been asking people, I know none of us go to their events for the chicken. We go there because we want to support them. So even if they're not serving chicken this year, um, please give them what you would have given them anyway, because they really need it. They're not only hurting, but they have more people in this county that they're serving who are hurting. So anything you can do would be a big help. With that, I'll thank you, Cat. Can go to the rest. Let me go ahead and introduce some of our speakers tonight. So we have Dr. Jack Smith, who is the superintendent <laughs> of Montgomery County Public Schools. Also, Chief Jones, Marcus Jones from our police department. Over here on my left, we have Heather Bruskin, who is the executive director of the Montgomery County Food Council. And we have Dr. Travis Gales, who is our chief health officer in Montgomery County. So let's get started with you. Uh, can you give us just a general overview, Dr. Gales, of the cases in the state and the county as of today? Sure. Good evening to everyone at home who's watching. And as always, I'd like to say thank you to all of our first line responders, however that is defined, who are working on the front lines to continue to provide the services to the residents of Montgomery County. So thank you to, to all of you. Uh, as it relates to the cases uh, or, or residents who've tested positive for COVID-19, uh, we are now over 2,000 cases in this uh, county, Montgomery County. Um, and over 10,700 cases across the state. Um, if you recall from our very first meeting, again, I'd, I'd like to talk in terms of how we progressed. We talked about the different markers and measures that we would use to determine our response. We went from talking about cases hypothetically in terms of preparing to the next week, our first three cases, to now obviously the case count has increased significantly. And as the county executive mentioned, a number of uh, provisions and precautionary measures have been put into place, including sheltering in place, closing of non-essential businesses, and social distancing. So we stand now over 2,000 cases. A number that I also want folks to look at is we've been following is the percentage of those who are hospitalized. Um, of the, the 10,000 cases in the state of Maryland, about 22 to 24 percent have been hospitalized at some point. 
That number is important because we use that as a measure to determine what will be the impact on our healthcare system. Uh, and so something else that we have spent a lot of time since our last town hall to today is working very closely with our hospital and health system partners to ensure that we have adequate bed space to up absorb the need if we see more people needing hospitalization. And even when they come into the hospital setting, making sure that we have the adequate provisions to provide critical care and intensive care to those who are our sicker patients. I'm happy to say that that partnership continues to work very well together and we are meeting the needs of our county residents as it stands. Now there's lots of people who ask about, well, when is the peak going to happen? Is the surge happening now? We don't really know for sure. Uh, we continue to look at the information as it comes in. We've got lots of predictive models. We are preparing and have been preparing from day one that the surge is happening imminently and, and right away. And so we continue to respond nimbly to our hospital partners to meet their needs in terms of making sure they have the necessary equipment to provide the services that they need. So I'll stop there and happy to and look forward to addressing questions throughout the evening. Thank you very much. Um, let's talk to you, uh, Chief Jones. Um, this is an, a question that we have from a county resident. I am really confused by the stay at home order. Where can I go and what happens if I'm out? Will the police stop me? I work for an essential business, so can I still go to work? What documents do I need to have? Please clear this up. Uh, so good afternoon and uh, that's a great question. Um, we want to let folks know that particularly those who are part of the, the essential uh, businesses and uh, that the governor has noted um, is that you are free to go to your business to and from, um, but that you also are free to go to uh, stores such as grocery stores, um, to the drugstore, um, to get uh, vital medicines, or also to go to get food to eat. Um, and so that, um, uh, that allows you, and you will not uh, be stopped by Montgomery County Police or any other law enforcement. That is not our, uh, that's not our motivation, and we are not um, focusing on individuals by stopping cars randomly or stopping people as they're walking randomly, asking them um, uh, where they are going. Um, and uh, if you do, uh, by any chance, in, uh, are um, dealing with a law enforcement officer by uh, being stopped for, uh, for a law enforcement reason, um, you can simply state you don't need um, documentation that states uh, where you work, uh, but simply just, be, uh, just provide the information um, of your employment um, and, and where you are going, and that will be sufficient uh, for you to proceed and go about your, and about your business. Chief, just to follow up to that, are the police officers required to wear face coverings and what else is being done to keep them safe? So, so officers are, uh, we are giving them the ability to wear face coverings. Uh, they have specific uh, type of face coverings that they wear. If they are going into stores and anything such as the governor's orders, we are requiring them to have their, their face coverings with them um, as everybody else is abiding by the, by the order. Um, and uh, we are also, because of the amount of equipment that they have, uh, making sure that they use their, their equipment when they're out in public um, in a rational and smart way. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Dr. Smith and CPS is still serving meals? If so, where do I go and how does it work? Also, are workers who are distributing the meals being protected? Yes, absolutely. To all of those questions, I uh, just want to say hello to all of my partners here and I want to be very clear in how much we've appreciated the partnerships here across the county uh, to meet the needs of all of our students and our families. Uh, we are serving meals. As of the end of last week, we had served 629,000 plus meals. We serve three meals and a snack each day to any child age two through 18 or enrolled in Montgomery County Public Schools because you might be 19 or 20 and be enrolled. And so we'll continue that service for as long as it's needed. Uh, it's, we have 41 different sites plus seven mobile sites and we also work with our partners in um, the county to provide weekend uh, supplements to people's diets and meals. Uh, you can go on our website and find all of those sites. You can see a, a map of them 
and we just want to encourage everyone to take advantage of this who needs it across the system and we don't ask questions or ask you to sign in if you need it then we want to provide it we will tell you that starting monday starting next week we'll serve monday tuesday wednesday and friday and on wednesday we'll serve two sets of meals so thursday will be covered so starting on monday april 20th we'll serve monday tuesday wednesday friday and on your wednesday visit you'll get enough meals for two days each of those times Thank you. Um, let's go back to you, Dr. Gales. I'll be with you in just a minute. Lately, there have been a lot of questions about the masks, the face coverings, and gloves since you issued the order. Can you explain to the order regarding face coverings and when people should wear a mask or facial covering? Are people required to wear them where, whenever and wherever they go out? Okay. So I want to make sure people at home understand why we're using different terms, so face coverings versus masks. Uh, in the, the, the directive that was put out, we will prefer to use the language face coverings because face coverings can be a host of different materials. Uh, we're working hard to preserve our mask, including our surgical mask and N95 mask for first line responders, including our healthcare providers. It's important that they have access to those because they add a level of protection needed based upon their level of exposure in working in high risk places and areas. So when we talk about face coverings, that can include a cloth mask that you have made, kind of like this one that I wear, um, or some other type of household, a t-shirt or bandana, something like that. The, the directive that we put out uh, and the directive that the governor has since put into place with his executive order that will go into effect on Saturday requires that it, uh, residents wear face coverings in a host of places, uh, pretty much in essential retail spaces. So our grocery stores, our pharmacies, uh, laundromats was included, um, also public transit, including the bus systems. Uh, and it also requires that employees, for example, in grocery stores, pharmacies, and larger retail spaces that have been deemed essential uh, businesses are required to wear them as well. The goal of wearing face coverings is to protect others in the event that you are an asymptomatic carrier of COVID-19. It adds an extra barrier to if you're coughing or expelling droplets, you know, through breathing and talking, it helps to block those and keep them from coming into contact with surfaces that others may come behind you and touch and pick up. So as uh, we move forward, there may be other opportunities where there may be other venues that are added to that. But as of now, uh, the governor's directive builds on what we put into place uh, to require face coverings in those spaces. Thank you. Uh, Heather Bruskin from the Montgomery County Food Council. As more and more people have become unemployed, the need for food and meals is a growing concern in the county. Where are the best places to go for information on food assistance resources, and where is food being served? Thank you so much. And as a resident, a parent, an employer, and somebody with underlying health conditions, I uh, thank all of our leaders uh, who are here um, and the many uh, thousands who are working tirelessly to uh, keep us safe. Uh, and so the Food Council is a community-based nonprofit uh, who convenes all these different stakeholders in our county's food system. Uh, and so we have the opportunity to work with lots of organizations and agencies that are, uh, that are feeding our residents. So before this uh, pandemic, we had over 60,000 residents who were at risk for food insecurity in Montgomery County. So for years prior to this crisis, we've been steadily building a strong network of over 70 food assistance providers. These range from large organizations uh, to some small faith-based pantries, and they all have been quickly adapting their service models to distribute meals and food uh, staples to residents, both at pickup sites um, and delivering to homes. Now, it's important to know that um, when visiting all of these different sites uh, to uh, practice social distancing, just as you would at, at grocery stores, and, and that's important to protect both the health of the volunteers and the staff that are distributing the food, uh, as well as uh, those who are receiving the food. Uh, but these providers have seen over five times the demand um, that they had prior uh, to just a month ago, the services that they were offering. And many of these recipients are people who've never used food before. And so it's more important than ever to make sure that residents are aware of the resources that are available. 
And so on the Food Council's website, and so that's www.mococoodcouncil.org, each day we're updating an interactive map that's searchable with information on all of these food assistance sites. There's also information on the MCPS sites. Um, and so we encourage you to search using your zip code or other uh, special resources. Do you need delivery? Do you need special diet accommodations and the food that's available? And these resources are also available in our website on, in Spanish, or you can call 311 um, if uh, that's easier than using um, web access. It's important to note that our farmers markets are also open and we're entering that season where it's a terrific opportunity to support our local farms and food producers. And Crossroads Community Food Network uh, is doubling the value of SNAP uh, for market purchases through the end of May. So those are also good places where you can use benefits programs like SNAP. And the grocery stores are adopting their models, many offering delivery and curbside pickup. And restaurants are offering those services as well um, for those who um, have the resources to make um, purchases for their food. Thank you, Heather. Uh, Mr. County Executive, you were uh, talking about the small uh, business community. I am a small business owner and unfortunately I had to lay off a number of employees. What benefits will they get through the county? How do they apply for unemployment? Are there services for undocumented workers? That's a good and complicated question, so I may ask you to repeat pieces of it. Okay. Um, so if they're laid off, they're eligible for unemployment. And the change in the unemployment law is significant. There is no waiting period, so you're eligible on the day you were left, you were um, let go. There is, um, there have been problems with processing things through unemployment, but they will get through it. And when they get through it, you will be backdated to the day you were um, laid off, which is good news. And probably the best news of all is that for a period of time, uh, the checks that people get in unemployment are being increased by $600 across the board. So whether you are getting $300 in unemployment or $430 in unemployment, you're getting another $600 on top of that. That is a significant difference. Uh, they said it, it provides an income for as short as it would be, but it provides the equivalent of income of somebody earning about $57,000 a year. So that's pretty significant. And that, we're hoping, helps people make the rent payments, continue to be able to buy food and get the things their family needs. The county is, uh, has $5 million right now that's gonna go toward individual assistance. We're gonna add another $5 million. To that, that'll get us up to $10 million. I'm anticipating we need, may need to do more. There are programs of housing assistance that are available to people regardless of their immigration status. And so county programs you don't have to worry about. And the governor sent us a list of social programs, including housing and other programs that the state has that do not have requirements for documentation. So we have on the website uh, the COVID-19 website, a list of programs at both the county level and the state level that uh, people are eligible for. We know there's a problem with unemployment because if you're undocumented, you're not eligible for unemployment. Um, that is, I think, a really grave oversight because these people are good enough to work here every day and to, you know, do all the work and take all the jobs that, that they fill in Montgomery County and then to say that if you're unemployed, you're out of luck, I think is a little bit cruel. And we think the federal government ought to be willing to step up and treat them like they treat everybody else who's been employed and no longer finds themselves with work. And the truth is helping them, that money's gonna wind up going back to Montgomery County business, Montgomery County landlords. It's all part of a package that's gonna help us recover. Thank you. Dr. Gales, I am concerned that African Americans and Latinas are disproportionately, I don't know how to pronounce that word, testing positive for COVID-19. Why is this happening and what can be done to flatten the curve? Desproporcionadamente in Spanish. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> so that question actually uh, touches on, even though it's not a long question, it touches on a lot of important topics. Uh, and I think it's important for folks to understand at home that we have seen uh, across uh, society, across demographic groups, cases of COVID-19. 
Where we've seen significant disparities is in terms of the disease course, uh, the fatality rate, and the morbidity associated with COVID-19 in a number of different jurisdictions. We're starting to get more data from the state and gathering that data on a local level to understand how those dynamics play out in our transmission factors. We can speculate, but we don't, can't say definitively that there are a host of factors that may influence transmission. One is the fact that we know that uh, communities of color are disproportionately in jobs that can't telework, don't have the luxury of having administrative leave to be at home and are continuing to have to come out into public uh, and to work and access public transit, those types of things. Uh, and so we are working to be able to translate the messages and the directives in ways that resonate with communities so that folks understand the impact of the different directors, directives in place. Now, when we talk about the differences in outcomes, a lot of that can be framed around, when, you know, for example, when, when Heather mentioned underlying medical conditions, it should not surprise any of us at home that when we look at the information, when we say that if you have diabetes, heart disease, or asthma, you are at increased risk for having a more adverse outcome. The data has shown for decades <laughs> that black Americans ha and Latino Americans have uh, higher rates of those particular illnesses. Now, I don't want to blame morbidity associated with COVID on them. Instead, I'd like us to pivot to a larger conversation to talk about the social determinants of health that drive that. We should be talking about the systemic policies as it relates to housing, food security, transportation, access education. to education access to edu uh, employment opportunities, and the impact that all of those factors have on predisposing certain races and communities to having a disproportionately higher number of those underlying conditions, which are setups for unfortunately having um, higher COVID-related uh, illnesses and, and uh, outcomes. So hopefully within this, we will continue to develop short-term strategies to increase testing capacity, and I'm sure we'll have the opportunity to talk about that later, but really have a genuine discussion to talk about these long-standing health disparities that didn't just show up today or didn't show up when COVID came around. They've been present for decades, but talk about the systemic factors and create the systemic change needed to address those issues so that we're not talking about this, God forbid we have a COVID-26 or COVID-35 in the future framed around the same constructs. Thank you, Dr. Gales. Dr. Smith, there are lots of students who have parents that have to go to work or don't speak English, so they can help their, ch their children with uh, the assignments. What support does MCPS have in place for those students? Are there tutors or translation services for them available? Yes, uh, among our 166,000 pre-K through 12th grade students, we have about 30,000 students who receive uh, English language support and services, ESOL support. And among those students, uh, they of course range from pre-K through 12th grade uh, in terms of the support. And so we have been doing um, a lot of translation for an interpretation for students. We have our ESOL staff members working directly at the elementary level with the teachers of the content areas and doing those online classes. We have many of our paraeducators contacting students uh, and families and talking with them about how we can help them, uh, whether we're talking about connectivity, digital tools, understanding the lessons, accessing paper lessons in addition to digital or in place of digital. Uh, at the secondary level, many of the ESOL teachers are the direct teacher for the students, and so they are running classes uh, each week and holding office hours each afternoon for the students. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of effort going on around that, but I in no way want to imply that is the same as regular school. It's not. And it's not the same for any of our students, whether they're receiving ESOL services, special ed student services, uh, regular curricular uh, support. Uh, it's a very different environment we're in, and we're continuing to build it out uh, as we go forward. And, uh, and learning every day as we go forward about how to better meet the needs of students and families in this very strange circumstance we find ourselves in. As a follow-up question to that, this is another question from a county resident. I am particularly concerned about students who don't have a computer or access to the internet. 
Is MCPS still distributing the Chromebooks? Yes, we are. We, uh, as of the end of last week, had distributed about 55,000 Chromebooks. Right now, we're working, and within the next three or four days, we'll distribute another five or 6,000 very targeted uh, Chromebooks where we've reached out to families and said, we've noticed you haven't signed on is our reason why. And so we're working with them both for those digital tools and for the connectivity, whether it's through Xfinity or some other system to make sure they are. And certainly one of the things I hope come, comes out of this whole situation is that we begin to understand that digital tools like Chromebooks and iPads and all of those sorts of things and connectivity in every home, every, we have it in every classroom, but that we are able to treat that in the same way we used to treat textbooks. So we used, every child used to have textbooks. Now they all need those digital tools and they need that connectivity and that needs to change. And I certainly hope in the next federal stimulus package that's being discussed that they, f they go forward with that plan to help create connectivity and digital tools across this country and including Montgomery County for every child. Thank you. Chief, this question is sort of a follow-up to the first question regarding the stay-at-home order. Uh, we have received a number of questions about undocumented people and what happens if they are stopped during the stay-at-home order. How will this be handled by law enforcement and is it mandatory to carry a letter from employer stating that someone is going to work? So um, as uh, we have here in Montgomery County, um, our policy in dealing with undocumented individuals is that we do not ask questions um, in any police engagement about whether an individual is undocumented. So if an individual is stopped for a traffic violation, for example, that there would be, no, the officer would not be asking for any documentation other than the person's driver's license and registration for that vehicle. Um, as it relates to uh, it being mandatory, for anyone to carry uh, paperwork? The answer is no, it's not mandatory, but we do suggest in some cases, um, you know, for example, like uh, individuals who are contractors, uh, maybe for the government or for essential uh, services that, uh, that uh, the governor has noted um, in his order, we do suggest that um, that uh, the, the business owner or the business provide a letter that an individual could carry um, in their vehicle and present to a law enforcement officer should they, uh, should they be stopped to provide uh, proof that they are essential in their duties. Thank you. County Executive, you mentioned uh, during your opening remarks about the public health emergency grant <coughs> that the county is offering and the fact that the application opened online yesterday. Now, I have heard, this is another uh, question, that the federal government, the state of Maryland, and the county are all offering help. Is there any coordination between the application processes for these funds, and can I get money from all three? So, theoretically, you can get money from all three, except the state program is now closed. Um, the Payroll Protection Program, which is one of the federal programs, I heard ran out of money today. So that program will be closed unless the federal government puts more money back into the program. Uh, the SBA grants appear to still be viable, and the SBA grants offer long-term loans, and they offer them at a, at a relatively low interest rate, and that has, uh, I think a lot of people have applied for them because of the long-term nature of the loan. I know from talking to business people, they are very worried about um, getting assistance and then discovering that the loans were gonna be one or two year loans and they'd be forced to pay them back very quickly because most businesses don't have the kind of margins that would let them pay back for all the losses they had in, this, in the space of a year or two. So the federal program with SBA, I believe is still open. Our program um, maximizes grants at $75,000. There are 1,000 businesses that will get anywhere, well, anywhere from as little as they ask for um, up to $75,000. Um, we are immediately processing everybody's request, whether it was for $2,000 or $75,000, and sending out 10, up to $10,000 checks. 
and for the ones that were above $75,000, we're also reviewing them, um, and they will be getting additional money as soon as their reviews are complete. We anticipate the, that one check will follow another pretty quickly. And we also recognize that in the county with tens of thousands of small businesses, depending how you count them, but many, many small businesses, more than 30,000, well more, um, a thousand businesses is just a fraction, which is why we've talked from the beginning about um, the importance of people applying for the federal programs. We knew that the limits of the federal programs, though there are limits, were broader than what we could possibly do in the county. And we didn't want people thinking that the county was going to be the only salvation. I mean, I, I know a couple of businesses who alone two months worth of lost rent would have been more than $75,000 or having to pay two months of rent with no income. Uh, so we've always tried to message that it's important that you apply. Um, it's not a mandatory condition of getting money from the county, but I think that it's a wise decision to apply for additional funds if you know that our limited funds won't cover your entire needs. Thank you, County Executive. Dr. Gales, I have read that the state is now providing information on COVID-19 cases by zip code in the county. Is the county providing that information as well? Yes, so if you go to the county website, uh, we actually have a link to the state website that now makes provisions so that you can follow along and see the number of cases by zip code uh, that was released, or at least the first introduction to the zip codes was released on Sunday. Um, and since that time, that information has been made available. So if you go to the county COVID-19 website, you can access the state map there and look to see how many cases are in your zip code. One thing that I will caution you in what we have tried to, the message we put out this week, is looking at cases in the context of the population. So for example, in the tweet that the governor released on Sunday, it mentioned that there were three zip codes in the Silver Spring area that were in the top five in the state in terms of number of cases. Well, when you take that into context to the fact that each of each, all three of them have nearly 50,000 or above in terms of population, it starts to give greater context. So for example, two, zip code 20906 has over 70,000 residents. And so when you talk about 150 cases in the context of 70,000 residents, the percentage of residents involved is like 0.2%. Compare that, you shift to other zip codes where that may be more impactful based upon the number of residents there. Now certainly any case of COVID-19 is concerning and alarming, but I just want to put the into context for folks when they go looking at the zip codes to try to mitigate some of the anxiety that they may have based upon the raw numbers. Let's talk about the big question, which continues to be testing. Where can I get tested? Why aren't there more? When will testing facilities be additional ones opening in the county? Sure, so this is, as we mentioned, we, we're pretty sure we get the question tonight about testing. Uh, so the testing remains based upon individuals who meet certain criteria, um, including whether they are symptomatic, uh, or they have histories concerning for coming into contact with individuals who are known cases of COVID-19 or highly suspicious cases of COVID-19. And so testing to this date has been tied to receiving a provider referral of some sort and either getting it directly in a hospital setting, an emergency room, a primary care office, an urgent care, or utilizing a provider referral. Now, over the last several weeks, we have seen other non-traditional, non-clinical sites come online to be able to provide those services, such as our vehicle emissions program site at White Oak. We've now conducted two weeks of testing uh, where we have tested over 200 individuals across the county who've utilized that space. We recognize, and this actually gets to one of the earlier questions related to uh, disparities in outcomes by race. We recognize that even though we see high numbers of cases pop up in communities of color, we know that we haven't tested everybody. And so we don't have a real sense of what the true burden and impact of COVID-19 is in communities because we know we need to test more folks. And we recognize that access to a provider, whether that's to a primary care provider to get that service rendered directly in their office space, 
or access to a provider to provide that referral to one of those other sites is limited. So what we're working on, and we're not ready 100% to announce it all together, all the details, but what we've been working on is creating an alternative source that can get people, uh, residents of the county, linked to a provider to be able to triage their symptoms, determine if they meet that criteria, and provide them with a referral to either our deep testing site or a couple of other sites that we hope to bring on live next week to provide additional resources. So that will be live next week? That is the plan. That is the plan. That's what we're working on. <laughs> uh, Heather, this is sort of a follow-up. You mentioned earlier the SNAP program. Mm -hmm. How do I access SNAP benefits or other special benefits during the pandemic? Who is eligible and how do I apply? And once again, are undocumented people eligible for any food or meal programs? I think you touched on that previously. Yes, thank you so much. It's very important to be talking about SNAP because there are some special benefits um, that are specific to this time. Um, so just to um, clarify, so SNAP, also sometimes referred to as food stamps, is a federally funded supplement for food purchases. And there are a variety of factors that determine whether or not an individual or a household is eligible, um, but it's primarily based on monthly income. Um, in addition to U.S. citizens, most documented immigrants who have lived in the country for five years or more and or received disability-related assistance are SNAP eligible. Children who are 18 and under who were born in the U.S. are eligible, even if their parents are not. And it's important to note that Montgomery County, um, when compared to all the counties in the state of Maryland, has the lowest enrollment of those residents who are eligible for SNAP, um, but not currently enrolled. So we have a lot of um, work to do to take advantage of these resources um, for those who are eligible. Um, there have been some um, specifics, uh, uh, changes to the program. Uh, there is a temporary suspension of the able-bodied adult without dependence restrictions, and SNAP recertifications have been waived for the next six months. Um, so those are specific to our current times. Um, to apply, typically uh, the, you could go to an in-person um, site that's run by the county. Those are currently closed, but you can still call the Department of Health and Human Services to request an appointment to get support uh, to enroll or to determine if you're eligible. And so that's, uh, you can call 240-777-1003. I also wanted to share a little information about some of the specific uh, relief package as aspects of SNAP. Um, so specific to COVID-19, an estimated 50,000 SNAP recipients in Montgomery County will receive the SNAP emergency allotment. And so what that means is no matter what uh, minimum benefit you are currently receiving, for example, in a household of one person, that's $15 a month, you will then receive the maximum um, benefit for that month um, for your household size. So that person who is receiving $15 a month can now receive $194 a month. For a household with four people, that's $646 per month. That's just for the months of April and May, and there's nothing special that needs to be done if you're already enrolled in SNAP to take advantage of those resources. Sources. Um, there's also another benefit um, called Pandemic EBT, um, and what that will do is provide debit cards to the families of students that rely on free or reduced price meals um, that can be used at grocery stores to purchase the food that the family needs while schools are closed. Each student will receive about $100 per month, and so that's estimated to be equivalent to the cost of breakfast and lunch. So students whose families are already enrolled in SNAP can have that PEBT benefit applied to their existing SNAP card. Students that are eligible for free and reduced rate meals but aren't enrolled in SNAP will need to be contacted and issued a special card. Um, and so again, you can call that number 240-777-1003. Um, and if you aren't eligible for SNAP, um, there are many other resources through our amazing food assistance provider network in the county um, that can provide additional support. Thank you, Heather. Uh, County Executive, not that the PPE have become so important for people and workers to have in public, what has the county been doing to procure PPEs for county workers and others? Uh, we've been trying to buy as much of it as we can get without limit. You know, I, I made a point of saying we're not thinking about buying for a two-week timeline or a four-week timeline. We are just buying. That's what we're in the market for. Uh, the state also has said they're expecting a large shipment of PPEs. But, you know, the governor said that we're told about these large shipments, but then when they actually come in, they're not. 
Um, we're hoping that this is actually a large shipment and that allocation will come to us and it would be a pretty significant allocation. Um, but that's not going to relax our efforts because we know that we'll go through this. It's not possible not to not go through it. So we're going to continue to buy even as we get cooperation from the state and even with our own successes here. Um, there are some local people who are doing masks, which is great. There are folks who, um, some of the distilleries that stepped up and turned their alcohol production into sanitizer production, uh, we're buying that. Um, we are we're dealing with a range of vendors we've never dealt with before. And it does require a lot of due diligence because a lot of the offers that come in are not from people that are on the normal vendor list. But when you can't find anything, you start looking at things, anybody who's offering it to you, because the important thing is to try to get these supplies here. And uh, we're paying a lot more than what the old face value of these things used to be in some cases, but that's the reality of the market. Unfortunate, but it is the reality of the market. Dr. Smith, I have heard about Zoom bombing and online safety. What is NCPS doing to protect students online now? Yes, yeah, so that's a, once again, a national conversation around so many students on, on digital uh, platforms right now. Uh, MCPS does use Zoom. Uh, after the governor announced on March 25th that students would not return to school at the end of the two-week emergency closure, we swung into action and uh, got involved with Zoom. And we've been able uh, for the past uh, two weeks to have a secure Zoom system where if you don't log in with an MCPS login, you can't get in the class. So we've essentially eliminated Zoom bombing from our uh, experience. And I watch this closely. Uh, and uh, we've also been able to put in some features working with the, the company that teachers have a default waiting room. So everybody waits to come in. And then the teacher can see if the student who's trying to come in is a student that belongs in that class or uh, a hacker out there in the digital universe who just hacks into platforms. Uh, this has happened for major corporations, for universities, for all sorts of people. But we've been able to eliminate it by having a restricted system, having waiting rooms, giving the teacher control over the muting function, the student uh, having the full class function so the teacher has to give me the ability to talk to my whole class or demonstrate something or show something. We've disabled the private chat so students cannot be talking just to one other student in the class while it's going on because that can be uh, difficult if students uh, act in an unkind or inappropriate manner toward one another. And we've also uh, really pushed on Zoom around student data privacy and gotten assurances from them about the data that might be available uh, for students. So it's, it's a national problem, uh, it's a state problem, it's a local problem, but we are uh, feeling positive about the steps we've taken to make sure that our students are safe and they're in an environment that is conducive to learning and uh, appropriate for them. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Chief, a number of people in the Asian community have raised concerns about discrimination uh, from the very beginning of the COVID-19 crisis. What do you want to say to them and the residents in this county? So, yes, I think that's a, a very um, important issue. Uh, we have shared with the Asian community um, our concerns um, in regards to um, any events that may be occurring to them that are incurring in such a way that um, it is a biased or, or hate, hateful type of incident. Um, to this date, we've, we have two um, reported incidents um, from the Asian community in relation to the COVID uh, crisis that we've been going through over the past few months. Um, what I have stated and I will continue to state to the Asian community is that if these events are occurring, we are highly encouraging you to contact the police department so that we can investigate. We investigate all hate crimes and bias incidents in Montgomery County 
um, particularly based upon race, but on a, ver a variety of other types of issues, um, such as uh, uh, race, religion, um, sexual orientation, gender, um, and beyond. So, but it's vitally important, the only way that we know that these are occurring is that we must be notified um, that these events have occurred. We will document um, these events. We, um, we make sure we investigate and follow up um, to make sure that these individuals who are responsible um, are held if they committed a crime. Um, we are pursuing criminal charges against anyone who commits a hate crime against anyone in our community. So again, we take these very seriously. Thank you, Chief. County Executive, what is the county doing to assist the homeless population? Well, we're continuing and expanding our programs. You know, Montgomery County, unfortunately, has had a historic policy of not housing the homeless, I think, after March until November. So we've kind of been absent from that field for many people. And uh, as a result of this, the shelter that we had to use as an emergency shelter when the other shelter failed in the fall because of um, issues with the landfill, um, we stood up a shelter on Taft Court. We are now opening up other shelter spaces so that we can provide social distancing space. Um, the rooms are to anybody who's been in the shelter knows people are too close together. So we are using these other facilities to house some of the homeless so we can create more space between people in their beds and they can have the opportunity to walk around and socialize without necessarily being in close proximity to each other. We've provided people with equipment that, that they need and we continue to, um, I believe it's both people who are vulnerable and people who are in quarantine who we've provided hotel rooms for. So people most, most at risk of the people in the midst of this, um, if they're not in the hospital, we've got them in a, in a hotel room recovering, if I'm saying that right, and Travis, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we're trying to make sure that we can isolate um, the homeless population in general from people who get infected within that population and that their circumstances allow for the kind of spacing that we're asking everybody else to maintain. Thank you, Chief. Um, have you seen cases uh, among the homeless population, Dr. Gales? Ah, uh, yes, there have been at, at least one or, or one or two, yes. Okay. I keep hearing about searches coming very soon to Maryland and D.C. What is a search and are the county hospitals ready? Okay. So before I answer that question, I want to pivot back to the testing question because I want to clarify a couple of things for folks at home. The reason why testing is important is because there's three core fundamentals to pandemic management, early testing, early quarantine, <laughs> and early treatment. We don't have treatment for COVID-19 at this point, but we do know that if we can get people to know their COVID-19 status early and get them diagnosed early, we can make sure that they are quarantining and isolating appropriately, cutting down on their potential risk of exposing others. And we know that for a lot of different reasons, if people don't have access to a provider, have mistrust in going to the health, health uh, systems, for a number of reasons, there may be individuals who are less likely to seek those sources and get access to those sources to be able to test and know their status and may unknowingly come into contact and transmit to other folks. So that's why we are emphasizing increasing testing capacity to get folks to know their status early on in the diagnosis period to cut down on the risk of transmitting to others. Now, as it relates to surge capacity, or not related to surge capacity, but to your question about surge <coughs> capacity. So when we talk about surge, that means that there is a significant increase in the number of cases. And when we talk about surging in hospitals, that means there's an increase in cases, but a correlating increase in the number of people requiring hospitalization. So if you can imagine, going back to one of the first things I mentioned, we follow the number, the percentage of people hospitalized. So let's say overnight we see 500 new cases and 25% of those are requiring hospitalization. So that's 125 folks. So you can imagine if that number increases every day over a sustained period, there's a lot of people who are going to require hospitalization. And so they're gonna need somewhere to go. 
And so as part of surge planning, we work with the hospitals to identify and make sure that we have enough bed space, staffing, equipment, critical care, and all of those types of services to be able to absorb if we do, not if, but when we see that number increase. Now, the challenge is, is to know when a true surge happens, it takes multiple data points. So for example, last week, there was a day where we had been going along, averaging around for the state about five to 600 cases a day. There was a dip, dropped down to I think it was 325. So there were some folks celebrating and saying, we finally got it, we've reached our peak, we're done. Those of us in public health took a, sigh, a, brief, uh, a deep breath to say, let's see. The next day we had 1,000 cases. And so to really know what the true surge is, again, it's going to be sustained over a couple of days at least. Uh, we are preparing for that surge to happen right now through the end of the month. There are different models that predict our peak could happen as early as this weekend to as late as early May. The reality is we don't know for sure. We're continuing to plan to make sure that we have the resources to meet the needs on a daily basis. And so I, as to, to your point in terms of hospitals being ready, uh, we are, have not reached capacity in terms of bed space. So we have room to absorb as those numbers increase. We monitor those number on, numbers on a daily basis. So we've got bed space. Now we do uh, wanna make sure that we have enough equipment to provide critical care services. So it's not just the question of how many beds do you have available, but what's the percentage of the beds? So for example, on an average, get any given day in a non-COVID setting, uh, most hospitals have about 12% of their beds utilized for intensive care and critical care services. The expectation in a pandemic is that you should have approximately 25% of your beds and equipment to be able to uh, provide those services. The hospitals have been working diligently on their individual plans, their systems plans, as well as coming together as a collective unit to do countywide surge planning. And so I feel comfortable and confident that we have the, uh, the services and supplies to meet the need of our, needs of our residents today. But we continue to plan in the background, as the county executive mentioned, getting more equipment, uh, making sure that we have adequate staff so that when that number does increase and the surge is realized, we're not caught flat-footed. We can respond in the present and meet the needs of our residents. Thank you, Dr. Gales. You explained a whole lot um, in that question, but there's a follow-up on that same question. Is, there, is the county working with the state, obviously with the hospitals, to make sure that we're ready? Yes, so we uh, have had a series of meetings over the last month uh, with our hospital partners. We've been in constant communication with our partners at the state. In fact, earlier this week, uh, forgive me the days mixed together, sometime earlier this week, Monday or Tuesday, we had a call uh, with the uh, leaders of the, the state hospital surge task force to talk through the plans that our individual hospitals have submitted uh, and discussed and walked through those, discussed what services and resources the state could provide, uh, and discussed other strategies which we will be announcing most likely in the near future as to some of the specifics of that plan. For example, uh, for those who are familiar with the uh, Adventist Hospital that's in Tacoma Park, uh, we've been working with colleagues at the state and the Corps of Engineers to discuss plans to be able to uh, get the, the, the majority of the hospital ready. Uh, they continue to operate a number of services there and have already started to absorb some of the um, lower acuity, non-COVID patients to be able to free up space in their tertiary care centers at White Oak and Shady Grove. Thank you. Um, Heather, about food services and meals. Um, there are a lot of seniors in Montgomery County and many are at home. They cannot move. Are there services uh, for them? Absolutely. Uh, and so it's important to remember that even before COVID-19, there were a lot of food access challenges for our seniors in the county. Uh, and so there's a lot of issues related to social isolation um, and inability to get to a retail opportunity for grocery stores. Um, and so, like Dr. Smith shared, our school system is running an amazing program um, feeding children and our senior nutrition program in the county is uh, doing a fantastic job as well of administering um, a meal program for seniors. 
So previously there had been a senior congregate meal program uh, where there were meal sites that were offering lunch to seniors every day. Um, obviously in times of social distancing, this is um, a program that's been discontinued for the time. Uh, so instead they're offering a grab and grow program instead. Uh, and so any eligible person, so who's 60 or over, um, can has the option to pick up seven frozen meals um, each week at one of the senior uh, rec centers. So they don't need to be an established participant in any of these programs. Um, rather, um, any senior can, can call up and, and get registered to receive those, those resources. Uh, deliveries are currently being made to two locations, uh, Damascus and Holiday Park, uh, but rec staff are taking orders for um, participation to transfer to sites uh, throughout the county. And if uh, you're unable to get to one of the centers to pick up these meals and you don't have anybody who could go and pick them up for you, um, you can work with uh, the rec center employees and the Jewish Council on Aging to get a no contact delivery of these meals to your home. Uh, we've seen over a 400% increase in use of uh, this program over the past month. And there's certainly anticipated that that will continue to grow. Um, for grocery assistance, the villages and senior connection programs offer uh, valuable support for that as well. And so to learn more about this, in addition to resources that are on our website, which I shared before, you can call 240-777-3000 for information from our county's uh, Department of Health and Human Services. Thank you, Heather. Uh, Dr. Smith, what kind of support is MCPS offering for teachers who are teaching from home and also handling their own children? We're trying to be very sensitive uh, to everyone to our parents, our families, our employees. And I, I would really just uh, uh, ask everyone to be patient and thoughtful and take care of one another in this situation because we have a million residents in this county and they have vastly different circumstances, vastly different experiences, vastly different levels of resource available to them within their home. And so we, we have instituted a well-being program for our staff members, and we're, of course, extremely concerned about those staff members who are on the front lines delivering those Chromebooks, those meals, taking care of the business that must be done out, out in the community and following the, the uh, protective uh, clothing and the, the face masks and everything else. Uh, but to be at your home with your children trying to work, whether you're a teacher or you work in some other field, is a stressful, difficult time. So I just really encourage everyone to stop, take a deep breath. We try to follow up when we get any messages from employees across the system that indicate that employee is stressed and to do a well-being call to check in and say, it's okay, you know, this is not going to be perfect. It's not going to be MCPS the way you've ever known MCPS. But we have to be kind, we have to be relationship focused, and we know learning will occur to some degree for children if we treat them well and, and maintain those relationships across the system. And Chief, let's talk now about the police officers. How are they policing differently now? And how can we residents uh, help? Ah, yes. Um, so again, thank you for that. Um, uh, so yes, our, our calls for service are down. Um, police officers are doing some things differently. Um, we are doing what we call virtual roll calls, where our officers are really not uh, coming into the stations and gathering as they would do at the beginning or at the end of the shifts. Um, they are actually uh, working through their uh, mobile data computers to communicate, to share information, to get information, um, and uh, to, to go to their respective beats. Um, we are um, handling a lot of calls for service via our telephone reporting unit, um, so that when people call in for certain things that need to be reported and a report needs to be written, we're taking some of those reports over the phone um, in order to, uh, to eliminate to some degree our contact with our, our residents when they need to make a particular police report. Um, and so the officers are doing pretty well. Uh, we just ask folks to, uh, again, as Dr. Smith noted, to also be patient with us. Um, we are, again, um, in a new environment. 
Um, we are again doing our very best to protect businesses and and uh, to respond to uh, people's needs uh, um, and uh, in our community um, as we as we you know work through several issues such as uh, responding more to domestic uh, disturbances in uh, in our community. Um, we understand that uh, again uh, people are at home and and things are happening and there's our disputes. We know that uh, folks are going through some difficult times, particularly as it relates to the economy, um, and that's understandable, but we would just uh, beg our, our community in many ways that if they yeah. are having some troubles at home to get some help, to reach out to the resources that are available, um, either through the Family Justice Center, uh, which does a lot of outsourcing as it relates to uh, domestic issues, um, as well as our crisis center. Um, so that there can be some negotiations and remediation of some of the complaints and, and arguments that may be occurring within our family. So again, we want people to be more patient. Our officers are available and, and are responding and, and trying to resolve many of these issues, but we just, again, we ask our folks to really, um, if they need us, we are there for them. So thank you. Thank you. County Executive, um, the President and the Governor are talking about developing plans to, uh, to reopening, for reopening. What will guide your decision to reopen county government and Montgomery County? Um, I'll take a wild guess that I'll probably be following the Governor's lead. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, the President has shown no interest in science, no interest in medicine, and uh, seems to think that the health of people is less important than putting people back in work. Um, that's not where I'm coming from. That's not uh, the lead of myself or any other county executive in Maryland, and it's not the lead of the governor of Maryland. And uh, I have found in every conversation with Governor Hogan that the discussion is about health first, and that he is cognizant that if you make a mistake and reopen, before you are certain that it's safe to reopen, that we will just be back here again. And he doesn't want to go there and none of us want to go there because all that'll do is prolong the layoffs, prolong the closing of businesses, prolong the absence of school. Um, and then when you get a rebound, we're not gonna even be prepared for that because it'll come on top of a situation that we mismanaged. So I will take my lead from the governor. Uh, he is, Work, I mean, I know his health officers are working with Dr. Gales. Um, we have an ongoing relationship and we'll develop the best policies. All of us want to be open. It's not like anybody would like to extend this. This is not summer vacation, where if you ask me and you say, can I extend your summer vacation for a month, I raise my hand and say, yeah. This is hard. It's hard on everybody. And we would all like to go back to more normal circumstances as soon as we can safely get back to more normal circumstances. So I know they're discussing this week measures they would take for how they might phase an opening. And I, I frankly believe there's gonna be an extension of some of the things we do. I mean, you could socially distance and still go to work. You could wear masks and still go to work. There are a lot of things you could do and still go to work and do the things you need to do. It's a matter of making sure that we, however we allow this, that we think about the things that, that we've learned from this that have made us safer and be assured that we're gonna continue the things that make us safe as we try to put ourselves back into a more normal environment. Um, but those decisions I'll be looking to Travis for because he is the doctor in the house and <laughs> ultimately he's gonna be one of the lead people in deciding what, what will make us safe. Um, Dr. Gales, um, describe what is the meaning of peak. I've heard the state saying that it will happen sometime early May, and uh, we've heard that it might happen earlier in the county. Sure. So yet another term to define, uh, and hopefully you're, you're keeping track of all of these terms at home, and hopefully we're doing a good enough job explaining them so you understand when they're thrown out on, on TV. So peak refers to, if you can think of it this way, it is when we are likely to experience the maximum number of cases, the maximum number of deaths, our, our worst day 
that's our peak day. And from that day, then we'll see everything start to decrease in terms of, in relation to that number. It does not mean that we stop that day and then we have no more cases. Doesn't mean that. So we're still going to continue to be impacted by COVID-19 after we experience our peak. Much like I talked about uh, the surge number, it's going to take some time to determine what that peak is because we need multiple data points. We just can't say today was the worst day. We've got to track that out a while and see. And what I want to emphasize to people at home is when we talk about the peak, or you may hear me say, yes, we've reached our peak in Montgomery County, or the governor or deputy secretary or secretary say we've reached the peak in Maryland, that does not mean we go back to business as we knew it before COVID-19 the next day. We'll continue and need to continue to keep those strategies such as social distancing and sheltering in place for some indefinite amount of time after that to get to your other point, this notion of flattening the curve. So what does flattening the curve mean? So when we're talking about curves, you can literally think of it as a curve of all of the cases. Without any actions, we expect the case is to go really high and get really tall before it drops down. These measures that we put into place have knocked that down. So when we say flattening the curve, that means we're cutting down on the number of new cases and we're cutting down on the number of deaths and fatalities associated with COVID-19. So all of the things that have been put into place have been put into place because they are proven evidence-based techniques that can decrease the number of cases at home, whether we're talking about uh, COVID-19 or any other illness. So peak, worst case, worst day, worst, worst experience, but then things will get better after that in terms of a decrease in the number. Uh, and as you've mentioned, there was speculation. This is how the models changed. At one point it said our peak was gonna be in June, then it was moved to May, and now there's conversation. I heard someone throw out and ask me the other day, is our peak coming this weekend? We won't know, but what we are hopeful is, and what we do have evidence now to demonstrate already, is that those actions that have been put into place collectively over the last six weeks have decreased the number of new cases compared to if we had not acted. And even though unfortunately we do have fatalities, it has decreased the number of fatalities that we would have expected to see if none of those actions have been put into place. Just a little follow up, you mentioned the word normal. When things start opening up, whenever that will be, what will that look like from the public health point of view and what will our new normal look like? Not shifting and shying away from answering you, but the reality is we don't know. Uh, I think a lot of what that new normal will look like and be defined is by the sum total of all of our actions collectively. There's going to be a significant economic impact that goes beyond where we are now. We've, we've talked about it. there's huge economic impact, but that's going to continue. How does that impact access to health care? How does that impact all of those social determinants that I mentioned in the beginning that we know disproportionately impact health outcomes for certain communities? We don't know. What does it look like in terms of, now everything won't be bad, it has introduced the opportunity for us to look at more innovative ways and modern ways of providing service delivery. Will we shift from a, a, an in-person patient encounter to more telemedicine? Will we see opportunities to develop and utilize technology in different ways to convey messages, to provide educational resources, uh, to shape how we interact with one another? Uh, so that's not, not answering your question. Uh, we just have a lot more uh, of data points and information we have to gather to really know what that looks like. Thank you. County Executive with so many county employees working from <coughs> home now. Has the county kind of been able to adjust, and how have you seen innovation that is encouraging during this crisis? Well, when I got here, the county had a policy of uh, allowing people to telework. Only, almost nobody was teleworking, because nobody was ever permitted to telework. <laughs> and so what happened was when this began, we started talking about teleworking, and I think our first universe would have been pretty small. And we went back to the managers and to the folks who do the work, and we just pushed on the question, can these jobs be teleworked? And we're up to over 20% of ours. I think almost a quarter of our hours um, are being teleworked. And that's pretty good when you consider that police and fire can't telework, and the social workers who have to run calls can't telework, and the people who have to be in offices 
and talk to people and counsel them and do things that they're doing can telework. There's a lot of things that can't be telework. I think we've, I think, done a lot, and I think it's shown us what's possible. And I think, you know, that if we can demonstrate that the workload can be accomplished in teleworking, there are a lot of advantages to teleworking. It takes cars off the road, it reduces pollution. Um, there are some people that argue it makes people more efficient because if you know that you're being measured by your output instead of the number of hours you sat in the chair, you're incentivized to meet your output goals, even to exceed your output goals so that people say, well, it's okay with you sitting in the chair because there was no loss in productivity. So how this all plays out depends on how everybody behaves and plays their roles. But I think, you know, we've learned that far more is possible than anybody thought when this started. We think there's more possible yet. Hopefully everybody takes a breath after this and we can have, we'll have a serious discussion. I mean, it has implications for the cost of operating county government, frankly. If I had less space to buy and less space to rent, um, we would be up financially. So there are a lot of reasons for everybody to make sure that this works in a positive way. But I think, and I'm going to digress for a second, that this is one of those things like the question about what normal looks like. Normal kind of depends on us. I mean, I've been saying throughout this whole thing that with no cure, no vaccine, the only variable that can control the spread of this disease were us. We could listen to advice to social distance, or we could not listen to it. We could put masks on or we could not put masks on. One of the things I know when I went to one of the governor's press conferences when he announced that he was going to require the masks, that followed a week earlier when he said people should wear masks. And he talked about the frustration of continuing to get pictures and seeing people in the parks, in the pavilions, having parties and barbecues after they were told to social distance. There was like, it did not register with people the severity of this. If on reflection, everybody realizes the severity of what we're dealing with and how our actions are the critical factor in deciding the spread of this disease, then I think normal could be more palatable a lot earlier. But if people look at, we're gonna let up now and we can do anything we want and go back to that, I'm not sure what that normal is gonna look like. I don't think that kind of normal is gonna keep us safe and keep us healthy. So I continue to implore people to think about the role that we as human beings play. It's not really often that somebody can get in front of you and say, it's human decisions that are gonna make a difference. This, if it's anything in our lifetimes that's ever been clear about the importance of the decisions we make, it is this. It's, you know, the, ep the epic fail of the economy wasn't based on bad decisions anybody made and businesses closed, but we weren't swamped by the rest of this. So I'm hoping that people take this seriously. It, we really can make a difference. I absolutely believe that. Thank you. Chief, what is the county doing to stop people who are not practicing appropriate social distancing? Um, if there are more than 10, not obeying the 10 rule, now that the, we the weather is gonna get warmer and people are going to be out and about more often. So yes, yeah, so it's a great question. We have been, uh, we have received calls for, uh, for people gathering more than 10 um, and uh, many different uh, aspects in, in out in our community, um, whether it be out at, uh, at our parks or our playgrounds. Um, we've also seen um, some parties, as the county executive noted, uh, where the governor had paid attention to that um, and we've made, and then when we respond to those calls, we are working with those individuals who are, who have gathered to have them voluntarily comply to uh, disperse and, um, and to abide by the, the order. Um, because again, we're looking at trying to make sure that people understand why the order is in place, the, the need to have social distancing in order to make our community safer and not to spread this virus. So. So we, uh, again, um, uh, unfortunately, we still receive calls um, uh, that, that this is occurring. 
Um, we are responding to those calls and uh, our officers are doing everything in, our, in their power to get people to voluntarily comply. And for the most part, over 99.5% of folks are complying without any, uh, without any hesitation. Thank you. Dr. Smith, um, Fairfax County had a computer problem today and had to shut down the learning. Are we prepared for something like this? And also, can people volunteer to tutor or translate and assist students? If so, how? This is a long question. Yes, uh, we are prepared for that. And uh, we do a lot of testing all the time of our systems to make sure. Now, of course, we also get attacked a lot, as does every computer system in this country. And uh, we've been able to uh, repulse those attacks when they've come in, uh, but it is important that we constantly test our systems to make sure that the hackers, wherever they may be in the community and the country or in somewhere else in the world, cannot get through. And so it's uh, a very important part of what we do as a school system. And lots of times people are very uh, frustrated because they say, well, why can't we get to this or why can't we get to that? Well, that's because when we open up to this or to that, we're making ourselves vulnerable to external attacks. And we just have to be so aware of that and so careful of that. Yes, people can volunteer. If they're already signed up as a volunteer for us, they simply need to contact the school or the office where they volunteer, and we will put them to work. If they're not, then we're not going to be able to take them as volunteers right now because we cannot have them in working with students uh, if they haven't had that clearance done, fingerprinting and child protective service background checks. But if they want to volunteer in other ways, the county has a very robust voluntary system. Uh, the food delivery and food provision service is a very robust delivery service. And to Mr. Elrich's point earlier, donate. Donate to organizations like the, the food provision services, like the charitable works that are working on behalf of people. That's a way you can also contribute right now. We have about 10 minutes left. Um, one last uh, question for you, Dr. Smith. I've heard that the state may be waiving some graduation requirements for seniors. Can you tell us about these changes? Absolutely, and, and I'll be brief because that's a big question, but I can talk about the ones that specifically affect uh, seniors because those are the most important shifts that were made this past Tuesday, the 14th of April. I wanna reference those though in light of something, something Mr. Elrich said and Chief Jones said. Mr. Elridge said, this is hard. And Chief Jones said, ask for help. Those are incredibly important statements. This is very hard. We have 12, 11,500 seniors right now who don't know if they're going to come back to school this year. I don't know if they're going to come back into a school building this year because I find out when you find out from the press conference of the governor. That's when I find out what's going to happen next. And I'm hoping it happens tomorrow that we'll know, but I have no guarantee of that. The state board, to their credit, swung into action and on Tuesday had a special meeting where they waived student service learning hours. So no senior will be missing graduation this year because of that requirement. They waived high school assessments and bridge projects. No senior will be missing graduation the year because, this year because of those things. We're also looking at a very different grading policy locally for fourth marking period, which starts this Monday. And people say, well, why can't I know what it is? Because literally a month and a week ago, I heard on the television that the first three cases of COVID-19 were in Montgomery County. It was March 5th on a Thursday night. I, I will never forget that experience. <laughs> yes, <laughs> on the television. And, and so, but we are working very rapidly because we are going to do no harm to students, we're going to err on the side of the student, and we're going to add value to the student's experience during this fourth marking period. And so as we construct this grading system, that's what the goal is. And remember, they range from pre-K through 12, they range from schools with 1% poverty to schools with 91% poverty. They range from schools with 1% students learning English to schools that are three-fourths uh, three of the student body are English learners. 
and so to construct something that meets the needs of all of those students and families is no small task and we're going to do it. So good news on the waiver front, thanks. We have just a few minutes uh, left and we would like for the county executive to do some closing remarks. Chief, one last question, is crime down? Have you seen an uptick on domestic violence calls? Yes, so uh, yes, crime is down um, and uh, we are, you know, there is still some crime occurring uh, but it is down uh, significantly over, overall. Uh, but what, one, one thing that does concern me is that domestic violence is up. Um, and that's, that's been quite disturbing for us to see. And as I noted about domestic disturbance calls, um, we've also seen this increase, <coughs> not as high as the domestic disturbance calls overall, but we've seen about a 15% um, increase in domestic violence cases. Um, so that's given me some grave concern and, and I, I've added some additional resources to work with that. We're working with the Family Justice Center. Um, we're making sure that our victims have the necessary resources that they need um, in order to uh, address these situations in the safest manner possible. Um, the court system is still viable in order to deal with any ex parte orders that we may need to, uh, in, that may need to be imposed. Um, and those are still being served by the Sheriff's Department. So again, though, that it is a, a, a serious concern that we have. Um, and again, we wanna work with our community, again, with those resources that I spoke about earlier um, in order to help people through these difficult times. Thank you, and for you, Dr. Gales, in 30 seconds, the testing criteria priorities, have they changed or are they still the same? Uh, so the priorities have changed and evolved over time. Originally, they were related to travel. We've navigated and moved past that with community transmission. So it's mostly associated with your symptoms, your disease presentation, whether or not you come into contact with someone who's highly suspicious. So yes, it has. That's how it's moved forward. That's us in 30 seconds. <laughs> thank you. And Heather, okay. how can he, people help the Montgomery County Food Council? Oh, thank you. Well, um, there's a lot that can be discouraging us these days, uh, but I have been overwhelmed and buoyed every day by the number of people and organizations and community partners that want to help. And there's lots of ways to do that. You can go on our website and search our food assistance resource map to find a provider near you in your community. They're in need of funds. Um, and just underscoring what the county executive said, uh, these are straining financial times for our nonprofits and for our food assistance providers. They also could use donations of uh, food, supplies, uh, masks or face coverings um, and also if you're interested in volunteering your time please go to the volunteer center website for information on how you can support their efforts and support local businesses small businesses grocery retailers restaurants um, that's a really important way to try to preserve uh, jobs as much as possible check in on your neighbors and offer to go to the grocery store with them obviously practice social distancing and care when interacting with them uh, but this is the time for the fabric of our communities to really support each other uh, through this time uh, and then finally there's a lot of crowdfunding opportunities to um, support local nonprofits to bring meals to first responders to healthcare workers to food insecure residents uh, through Facebook groups like support moco restaurants and and uh, you can put in a little bit of money and help buy some meals uh, while also supporting our local restaurants. So just a few ideas of, of how we can do our part to get us through these times. Thank you very much. And Mr. County Executive, some uh, closing remarks. So I want to first of all thank everybody on this panel. I know that, that you're doing hard work every day and the stress has got to be serious. Um, we don't have roadmaps for what we're doing. But this is not something any in our lifetime that any of us know about. I don't even know if my grandparents would have experienced anything like this. Um, so it's a, it's a really challenging place to be. But everybody I feel on this team is working overtime, extra hard, and amazingly competently to address the challenges that are in front of us. Unfortunately, we live in a state where the general politics of the state are aligned in a way that allow us to address these challenges. And I think that's, that's important. And to be able to work with, from the top to bottom, with people who share those concerns is absolutely critical. I also want to remind people, as bad as this is, it will end. And there is going to be a tomorrow. And life will go back to some form of normal. And some form of normal will 
you know, leave us with lives that are far more enjoyable than they are now, even if there are some restrictions on them. Um, but it's critical that we do get the economy going. And that's, the, I think, the cost of the virus may be dwarfed by the cost of dealing with the economic damage that's been done. And states and counties are in a limited position to provide support to people. I, I noticed, you know, California's governor announced they were going to do $500 checks for 150,000 undocumented folks. And I thought, hey, that's a drop in the bucket of the undocumented folks in California. And it's also $75 million. And so the amounts of money we're talking about are absolutely staggering. And if ever the national government needed to act like it was on a war footing, it's now. It is worth putting money into the economy. It is worth making sure the businesses, and this is my greatest fear, is the businesses will look at the debts that they will, they're building up. Probably two months of non-paid rents, possibly non-payment of loans they had. And if they cannot get a path forward with grants, they may decide it's not worth taking out the loans and they're not going to open again. And if those businesses don't open again, people aren't going to get jobs again. And this is going to be longer and deeper than it needs to be. People need to make the investment into, into the community and into the businesses. They absolutely have to do that. Um, and I think the federal government's got to play its role. Uh, we're going to do what everything we can do. And I want to encourage people to think about what lies ahead of us. We still, you know, everything that we were challenged with before is still there. Heather was working with food problems in Montgomery County before this happened. Travis was dealing with health disparities before this happened. We're trying to deal with affordable housing. We're trying to get the economy off the ground to the extent that we have local control. We need to remember we still have those jobs to do and we're going to keep working on it. So thank you all for tuning in today. Thank you everybody for joining us today and for you at home. Remember to follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, and also on the county's website. Thank you and good evening.